Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So I want to explain that this idea of social science that was created in the West is a great uh, deception and a problem, a serious problem for us, because the idea of science does not work when you apply it to the study of societies. Because science is the study of universal laws, you know, like the law of gravity, which is the same in all places. It is the same in Iran and Pakistan and England and Brazil. And it is the same in the 19th century and the 20th century and the 21st century. But in societies, we don't have such laws. And so what has happened as a result is that the Europeans have taken some patterns which are extracted from their own historical experience. And they have extracted these as laws and they have applied these to all societies. And because we Muslims are so impressed by the West and their technological achievements that we accept, it, even though they, we see that it is ridiculous. So, for example, modern economics, somebody has speaker on modern economics says that the purpose of life is to maximize the pleasure that you get in this dunya. This is what the textbooks of economics teach. Now, as Muslim users say, nonsense, this is absurd, this is ridiculous, this is not true. But nobody says that. The Muslims are so much in shock and awe of uh, uh, West because, you know, their technological achievements, they have these computers and audios. So they think they also can look into the heart of the human beings. And this is false. The West is like the Dajjal in the sense that they have very deep insight into the external reality, the world around us. They can split the atom and they can send a rocket ship to the moon. But they have they are completely blind to what goes on inside the heart of the human being and the soul. They in fact they reject the existence of these things. They say the heart is just a pump. It has no feelings and the soul doesn't exist. And these are not sources of knowledge. So, because of this um, blindness, uh, they are uh, creating a theory which they think applies to the whole world, which it does not. It doesn't even apply to the West. And we are following them. So, once you understand that science is not uh, a good way to think about social change, then you can go back to the Islamic tradition for how to study society. And we have an intellectual tradition of thousand years and we can build upon that. <clears throat> but Muslims have forgotten how to do that these days. And so one of the critical things in studying a society is history. If you want to study the society of Iran, I, uh, the society of Iran, the economics of Iran, before the revolution is different, in the time of the Shah, it's different. Uh, before the Shah, it's different. So you can't, there is no one economic law which applies to Iran pre-revolution and the same law applies after the revolution. It's not true. Now, economics says that there is such a law and it is the supply and demand, but this is false. The law of supply and demand does not actually hold. It is not a law. So you want to, if you want to study economics, you have to study the history. Uh, one of the critical things to understand is that um, every economic theory originates from the study of society. You see, you you are so we are looking. We are. I am in Pakistan these days, uh, actually, and so in Pakistan we have some problems. We have huge government debt. We have uh, low productivity in agriculture, etc. So now if I study economics for Pakistan, I will be thinking about how we can raise agricultural productivity. How can we help uh, uh, the poor? How can we feed the poor, which is the order of the Quran? And this is a very different kind of problem from the problems that we would have if we were studying the economy of Nigeria or of Iran or of Russia. 
So every society has its own problems. And so if I develop a theory for this, the theory will depend on what I am looking at. But because of the uh, false idea of science, uh, if you look at the economics textbooks, look at any economic textbook, and they will start writing mathematical equations as if it's a, it's a physics textbook. So this physics textbook, uh, it doesn't say okay, these laws, are these laws being studied for Iran or are they for Afghanistan or are they for uh, uh, Nigeria or are they for Brazil? It doesn't say anything. But by, by not saying anything, it deceives you into thinking that they are valid for all societies. And this is false. It is not true. So, for example, Keynesian economics, which was a very important analysis of economy, was based on the analysis of the economy of England in 1929 to uh, 1940s, between the uh, after the Great Depression and before the World War II. And he even said that some in, in one in one of few sentences that my analysis is for this society. It's not generally valid for all societies and all time. But now in our textbook, we study Keynesian economics as if it is a universal law. To understand what Keynes was saying, you must look at the Great Depression. What happened, where it happened, why it happened, because Keynes was trying to analyze that economy. And then, so basically, this is the critical point. Similarly, now once we understand this, that theories are aligned with history. So Islamic economics is also aligned with history. It was produced by historical forces, and it has changed according to history. So uh, this is why um, this concept of first generation why was Islamic economics born? When was it born? What were the historical circumstances in which it was born? Uh, that will lead you to understanding of what is Islamic economics. And this is never explained because we are also, in our Islamic economics, we are also imitating Western theories. And we say, okay, just like their theory is valid in all time, so our theory is also valid all our time. It is not true. So this is just some background as to what I want to do. Now I want to get um, to, to start this uh, discussion from uh, my slides. OK, so these slides have just put up and you should be able to download them. So three generations of Islamic economics. So. Uh, one of the orders, first of all, we must understand that Islamic economics should be founded in the Quran and the Sunnah and the intellectual heritage of the Islamic civilization. If you look at most textbooks of Islamic economics currently existing in the world, you will not find this to be true. You will find that these textbooks are based on the theory of economics as it developed in the West with the modifications from uh, from Islamic ideas. So actually, modern textbooks are part of what is known as the Islamization of Knowledge Project, which means that the West has some knowledge which we do not have, and we take this knowledge and we Islamize it by, uh, uh, by taking away anything un-Islamic and adding Islamic elements. But the core is Western knowledge. That is the source of our knowledge. And then we will modify it to fit Islam. That is the Islamization of knowledge. Now, the third generation, the critical thing is that it rejects the Islamization of knowledge approach. It says that, no, what the West has is not knowledge. It is ignorance. Allah amanu min al nur so we start with the premise that they are in ignorance and darkness uh, the scholars of the west and so they don't have knowledge so there's nothing to islamize so instead we reject what they have done and we start from our own foundations to build economics so this is 
the definition of third generation economics, that we don't start from Western ideas. We start from the Quran and the Sunnah and the intellectual heritage of Islam. So the first and critical thing is that the society of Islam started in Medina by the Mawakhat when Allah Ta'ala made the Muslims Ikhwana, the brothers. And in another place in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala says that Allah Ta'ala put the love between your hearts. And this love is more precious than anything that can be purchased with gold and silver. So the beginning of Islamic economics, we start by rejecting macroeconomics because macroeconomics at the level of nation, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, all of these nations were created after World War I as a pro part of a project to divide the Muslims against each other. And they have been very successful in doing this. So when we do macroeconomics, we're already stopped doing Islam because macroeconomics is at the level of the nation. We want to go back to the level of the Ummah. We will think when we talk about economics, what is the economics of the Ummah as a whole? So if there is a trade deal between Pakistan and uh, Iran, we won't talk about what is the advantage to Pakistan and what is the advantage of Iran. We will talk about the advantage to the Ummah, the cost to the Ummah, and the benefits to the Ummah. This is the way of thinking that we need to develop for third generation economics, Islamic economics. So <clears throat> this, this is uh, another um, verse which uh, stresses the unity of the Ummah. So this has to be at the foundation, at the core of Islamic economics. You can't accept, uh, you see, Western microeconomics is based on the philosophy of individualism. I alone, me, myself. This philosophy has no place in Islam. Uh, our building unit is the family. Then it is the neighborhood. Then it is the community. Then it is the, you see, even the our institutions, the masjid uh, represents the neighborhood. Then the Salatul Jum'ah is not for one neighborhood. It is for multiple neighborhoods. They come together. And then there is the Eid, which is for the whole uh, grouping in the nearby area, but only in the nearby area. And then there is the uh, Eid Al-Adha, is the whole ummah gets together in the same place in the Kaaba. So this is the natural grouping level for economics in the uh, Islamic ideology. But you see Muslims so blind that we think of individuals and then nations. No, we start with the community. That is the, our smallest. So we have to have mesoeconomics, which is the intermediate level between the individual and the uh, whole nation. And then we have Ummah level economics for which they have no word. And then we can actually go one higher level and think of economics for the whole human beings. Okay, Allah Ta'ala says that all of the creation of God is the family of God. And if we love the, if, if we service, if we provide service to the family of God, then Allah Ta'ala will love us. So, uh, we have to think of the whole creation, which means all human beings and all animals and all plants, everything is the creation of God. And so we have to love all of these things and to protect them and preserve them. And if we do that, there will be no climate crisis. So, <clears throat> uh, capitalism arose uh, when Western societies rejected Christianity. And after rejecting Christianity, they said that, okay, there is no God. So uh, this life is just uh, a jungle because we are just animals because there's no creator. So human beings, they, uh, this world was created by chance. And then uh, the uh, life evolved by chance and man is just another kind of animal. And so in the jungle, we have survival of the fittest and we have competition and everyone is only interested in his own self. So that is greed. And then there is individualism and hedonism means that after there is no life after death. So we must pursue pleasure in this world. 
so pleasure power and profits are the goal of life for western economics so according to how you think of what a society is so uh, you design the institutions of that society so in the west the bank came into existence after the rejection of christianity because christianity is against accumulation of wealth christianity says that the love of wealth is the source of all evil that is what is in the written in the bible and we have similar statements in our uh, quran and sunnah so once uh, they said no uh, the goal of the life is to make money so then they said okay then we need some place to make money and to collect money and to grow money and that was the bank in islamic society the spirit allah taala yani the sahaba asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what should we do with our wealth is written in the quran so allah taala says that spend it uh, the spend it in the path of allah Uh, all that is beyond what you need so now how do you spend on others well that for that you have the waqf so in the islam the spirit of the society is spending on others so we have the our financial institution is the waqf the um, uh, in capitalism you have the goal is to accumulate wealth not to give it to anybody else so if you have a million dollars and everybody else in your neighborhood is starving you don't care you say i'll put my 1 million in the bank and i will make 2 million from it now in islam if you have a million dollars and people are starving then you must spend it on them not not make more money out of the money that you have so today we have uh 10 people in the world and they have more than half the wealth of the whole whole planet why and why do they need so much wealth why do they want so much wealth there is it makes no sense but this is the what they have been taught that wealth is the you you must pursue wealth and create wealth and make more wealth so the institution of banking is promotes this uh, greediness and selfishness and the waqf it promotes generosity so it reflects the spirit of the uh, society so this is now in capitalism you have insurance because when you are dealing with large amounts of money and you're doing trade then you take risks and so uh, you can get insurance if your house burns down if your ship burns down then or if your ship is lost then you can collect money from the insurance now in the western capitalism insurance like all other transactions is adversarial it is made between enemies because there are no friends in capitalist society you don't have any friends so every everybody is an enemy we are in competition with each other so there is somebody who makes a bet with you he says that okay if your ship loses you you pay me some money because of, because of 100 ships only one ship will sink so you pay me a 1000 and everybody pays me 1000 i will get 100000 dollars from 100 ships one of these ships will sink and i will pay that ship uh 10000 20000 maybe 50000 and i will make money so this is the this is kind of gambling it's it's collect they collect the risk and then they insure against the event so health insurance is like that okay one person in 1000 is going to get cancer and the treatment for cancer requires 50000 so if everybody pays me 100 health insurance i will get 100000 and then one person will get cancer not everybody is going to get cancer so i will pay him 50000 and i make profit so 50000 so this is how it is uh, it's a it's adversarial because uh, when somebody reports to me that my ship was lost i say okay how much was it really lost maybe you were trying to deceive me uh, maybe you set fire to your own ship if you did that i will not pay you any money 
and you say that oh i was my ship was carrying uh, uh, goods which were worth 50000 i will go and evaluate there is a proper auditor process which says no no your goods were not worth 50000 they were only worth 20000 so there is a dispute between us the person who is insured he wants to get the maximum money from me and uh, i want to give him the minimum amount of money because i am trying to make profits and this is what happens in real life real world insurance that uh, you make a claim and then there's a claims adjuster who comes and he checks to see if your claim is valid and and he tries to minimize the amount of the claim in islam we have insurance but we have in different spirit it's the kafil the kafil means taking care of each other so now we have 100 ships we, uh, we are all owners we get together and we say brothers uh, we have all sent our ships we are all taking risks and so let us put some money together to help anyone who has problem who has who has uh, so we all put together the money and there is a pool of money and then uh, if one ship dies then we say okay this uh, our brother has had some problems so let us use this pool of money to help him so we say here your ship was lost at sea and here is 50000 so the person says no oh, you know my loss was only about 20000 because i don't want to take uh, more money from your brothers than what i need because this is for others so i will take only what i need and less than that i i, I only need 10000 to get by i can put my get my business back together with 10000 so you keep your money and uh, use it to help others and I will try to get myself up. So this is the, the spirit of the kafal is not adversarial, it's cooperative. <clears throat> and this is true for the all transactions <clears throat> in, in Islamic society, that the spirit of the transaction is cooperation. So in um, Western societies, they have microfinance uh, in, and they give money to the poor. And what happens, they charge interest from the poor. According to last uh, research I saw, uh, microfinance is a way to exploit the poor. Uh, you give them loans and uh, they pay 20% interest on it or something in that neighborhood. So uh, you give them loans, you ask that you should exp help them put a business and you say, oh, look, they are, they are running a business and they are making lots of profits. So uh, I am helping them. But what about the 20% that you are earning? Uh, so you say, and, and this argument has made, that you know I'm only charging them 20%. If I wasn't there, then there is the uh, famous lender and he charges 100% interest. So I'm actually helping them to avoid 100% interest. So I am actually a benefactor. But you know, Islam doesn't accept this kind of logic. So in Islam, we have to help the poor. We give them money, it must be at zero interest, and there are um, rules uh, which say that, well, if when you ask for uh, payment and he cannot pay, you should try to give him uh, help and uh, delay the demand or even forgive him. So, Qarja Hasana is in the helping spirit. If somebody is needy, you give him the money at zero interest and you try to help them. Now, another institution in capitalism, you see when the people are out to um, make maximum profits, then it is very dangerous to have a monopoly. In the USA, the doctors have a monopoly on the profession and they charge maximum amount of money. The same thing which uh, costs uh, $1,000 in USA can be done for $100 in uh, Canada and even in other places. Medicines here cost $1,000, they cost $10 in the rest of the world. Why? Because when you have a monopoly, you have a life-saving medicine and you can sell it at any price you like because if he doesn't buy, then he will die. So giving anybody a monopoly is a very dangerous thing. Now in Islamic society, we used to have guilds. So the guilds are, for example, the collection of doctors. But their goal is not to maximize profits. Their goal is to provide service to the society. So when the guild of doctors 
they can charge money but if anybody dies in, in any place then you go to the guild of why did you allow that person to die so they will be responsible they are responsible for providing the service and they say okay uh, this person died because we didn't have a doctor in the village it's very difficult to reach the villages but now we will make uh, plans to send somebody to every village even in the remote areas and uh, so they collectively think about how to serve the society so this is these are some of the institutions of an islamic society but they are very different from the institutions of a capitalist society so, <clears throat> um, one of the critical ideas for organizing an Islamic society is social responsibility. And again, this is a very different thing from the organization of a capitalist society. In a capitalist society, you have competition, you have um, cutthroat competition, you have survival of the fittest. The firms are there to compete with each other. In Islamic society, we have social responsibility. If there is anybody who is poor, anybody who is hungry in the ummah, then it is the response, a collective responsibility of all Muslims to make sure that we that food reaches that person. Now, this collective responsibility is organized. It is organized by a local area. So if somebody is hungry, then the first responsibility is on his neighbor. And if all the neighbors are also hungry, then the people who are next to them, the there is one community and then in the people in the next masjid. And if the whole nation is hungry, then the whole ummah is responsible. So like in the case of Palestine, Palestine, uh, we are all responsible to help them now because they cannot help themselves. So uh, that is the principle. And this principle is a contribution of Islam to the world. And this idea, this concept did not exist before Islam and it still doesn't exist currently anywhere in the world. Uh, we still have this, but we have also forgotten it because we have our minds have been colonized by Western ideas. So uh, this is a big idea, but there are two very special things that uh, I want to mention that because those things are practical and we should be working on getting this back because Islamic society is just an idea right now. Islamic economics is just an idea. It doesn't exist on the planet, but we want to build an Islamic society. We want to build Islamic economics. Then uh, there are some things we have to do. And there are two critical things that we need. This is the place to start an Islamic economics and an Islamic society. And the place to start is to say that education is a collective responsibility. If somebody asks for, if somebody is seeking knowledge, then immediately it becomes the knowledge, uh, the responsibility of everybody to make sure that he gets the knowledge. We don't go and ask. This is only in a capitalist society. If somebody is seeking knowledge, you say, okay, do you have the money to pay for, for education? This is a joke in an Islamic society. What nonsense. Somebody is seeking ilm. Now, the one with the, who has the ilm, he is responsible to provide the ilm to the one who does not. It is not the ignorant who is going to uh, pay money to get educated. This concept doesn't exist in Islam. So in throughout 1000 years of Islamic history, nobody had to pay for an education. When you went to a place of learning, then if you were accepted for, um, uh, for, for study, then all your needs were taken care of, your food, your housing, everything. You, you, are, you, you are provided for and you pay attention to your studies only. So this is the thing. So we need to start that kind of education. And some initiatives are there already. Today, I have, I have recently joined Akhwat University in Pakistan. And we provide free education to all students. And I think there are many institutions in the Islamic world which do the same thing. 
but we need to do this on a mass level that every 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 student in the islamic world should be able to get education uh, without any barrier because of finance or other similarly for health in um, in the health provision we used to have institutions bimaristan in which um, once a patient comes then you take complete care of him not only you provide for him in fact i was reading an account uh, a patient would come in he would get four attendants one to look after his physical health and provide medicines one to take care of his um, of his um, exercise and uh, needs uh, for rest recreation one to take care of his spiritual health and somebody would provide money to his family because you say this person is sick he can no longer work for a living so who's going to look after his family while he's sick so uh, they would give some money to make sure that the while the person is sick then somebody is looking after the family so you see this is how any yani, a person is sick it's not his fault that he is sick now it is the responsibility of society to take care of him while he's sick so this is the concept of islam and it's currently not available anywhere in the islamic world but we used to have it uh, but also we do have some institution like in pakistan we have a number of hospitals where anybody can go in fact in indus hospital there is no uh, financial department uh, when you go in you don't you don't have to go to see uh, to see the treasurer and, and to pay your fees there is no money exchange for medical services and there are some other institutions like that in the islamic world too but very few so i said that earlier that islamic economies no longer exist now everybody should understand that that is true today our in all over the islamic world we are living in capitalist economies and we think like capitalists we are thinking selfishly and when we go to university we study um we study for a job and we seek knowledge for the purpose of making money again this is very very bad this is not the purpose of ilm and to start with we can make a change in a niyyah because capitalism teaches us that the goal of education is to make money so we have to change that and for the professors and for the students our goal in pursuing knowledge is to serve the ummah so all kinds of knowledge will qualify even when you study western knowledge even you need study kufr uh this is useful because we need to we need to study it to understand how the world is running so that we can help the people so there is no even though uh, western economics is actually kufr because they are teaching you that the purpose of life is to maximize pleasure and this is kufr because it's uh, directly against the teaching of the quran the purpose of life is not to maximize pleasure and uh, allah taala says lan tanal birra hatta tunfiqu mimma tuhibbun so instead of consuming what you love you give up give it away for the path of allah so this is minimizing utility not maximizing utility so even though we are studying kufr it is permissible if we to study kufr if we use it to help the ummah so with this niya we can study western economics but we should understand that it is not the truth it is a falsehood so uh as i said in the beginning to understand what's going on we have to study the history of the world history of the world is not part of conventional economics and so islamic economists also don't look at history and this is a big mistake because you cannot study any kind of social theory without studying the society for which this theory applies so in order to understand what islamic economics is we have to study the history of the world and one of the questions is why did islamic economics start in the 20th century we don't have a subject like islamic economics in 
the thousand years of Islamic history, in the intellectual tradition of Islam, there is no book on Islamic economics. Why? So, um, first we have to understand that the Islam, uh, the concept of Islamic society was destroyed by the process of colonization. And um, in particular, uh, when the Khilafat was lost 100 years ago, then the political structure of Islamic, the last surviving political structure of Islamic society was lost. And that is the backbone on which Islamic society is built. And so basically, Islamic societies ceased to exist 100 years ago. Now we can rebuild them and we don't have to rebuild them in the same way. Uh, we, but we can, uh, we have to adapt them to modern conditions and there are ways to do that, but um, let us discuss <coughs> further. So, um, Islamic economics actually emerged in the 20th century under the influence of the liberation movements, which started in all the colonies after World War I. After World War I, uh, all over the Islamic world, about 90% of the Islamic world was colonized at that time. And so all over the world, movements for uh, liberation started. And this Islamic economics was part of the movement for liberation, that once we achieve independence from the West, from the colonizers, then we will create our own economic system and it will be like this. That's what uh, Islamic economics was. So, as I said, for the, over the period of colonization, which lasted for about a century, um, all the social structures of Islamic societies were modified or adopted to Western social structures. How were they, how were they adapted? Because the Western uh, societies had the social science and they used this social science to impose it upon the Islamic world. And as I already said in the beginning of the talk, uh, this social science is built on lessons derived from European history. And so they imposed patterns of European society on uh, colonized societies. So in Pakistan, we had our own judicial system, we had our own health system, we had our own educational system, and all of these were destroyed. These, our original systems were much better than what was put in as a replacement by the West. The, so the institutions of our society were built on theories developed in the West and were based on patterns that were suitable for Western societies and not suitable for Islamic societies. And we are continuing to use those ideas, those theories. We are studying Western economics, we are studying Western political science, and we are using these ideas to build our own societies. So it is critical to understand this deception. We have to reject all of Western social science and we have to rebuild it on Islamic foundations. And I have explained how we can do that in these two lectures. So once we reject social science, we reject all of it. And so we have to rebuild a new science for society. And our foundation will be based on Ulum al-Umran, which was created by Ibn Khaldun. And he initiated the study of society. And his methodology for studying society is very different from Western methodology. So to just give one example, he says that in the beginning of his book that I'm going to study the process of social change. You see, if you look at economics textbook, they start by saying we are going to study economic equilibrium. What is equilibrium? Equilibrium is a place where society does not change. It remains in the same place throughout time. Now, this is stupid because all societies are continuously changing. Every society is growing. Any population is increasing. So obviously there is change. So when you say equilibrium, 
then there is nothing. Why? Where does this equilibrium come from? It comes from physics. It comes from 19th century physics. People, uh, 19th century physics people were studying equilibrium, so they borrowed this idea, and they're still using this stupid idea. There's no equilibrium, but the process of studying the process of social change. Now that is a good idea, an interesting idea, and that is what Ulumul Imran would do. So we will say, if we have our own science, instead of now they say, okay. Um, you see, the second generation Islamic you know, says we are going to study equilibrium, but we are going to study equilibrium in, in an Islamic society. So that's nonsense. I mean, equilibrium is not relevant. I mean, what you are trying to do is Islamize equilibrium. But instead of that, you reject equilibrium and say, no, equilibrium is wrong. We will study the process of social change just like Ibn Khaldun did in Al Muqaddama. So um, he will, uh, if we follow him, we will use a historical approach, we will use a qualitative approach. And this approach was the basis for economics until the 19th century in, in the West. Uh, it was in late 19th century that the economist abandoned this approach and replaced it by mathematical and quantitative and scientific approach. And this was a big mistake. This methodology leads to misunderstanding of the world and it has to be changed back to the original. So basically, um, the one of the principles of Ulum al Umran is that theories come out of the study of society and they cannot be detached from the society, from the historical context. So whenever we study an economic theory, we will study it in the context of a particular society, a particular history, a particular time and place. And this simple methodological principle is not understood by Western social science. <clears throat> so, uh, we have idea, so some of the questions that we, when, as soon as we start thinking history, then we come up with these historical questions. Why did Islamic economics emerge in early 20th century? And how can it be Islamic if you don't find it directly? There's no books on Islamic economics for a thousand years. And I have provided an answer to this question, so I will not dwell on this here, but there is a paper on crisis in economic, Islamic economics and I have in my blog uh, posted several lectures on this. So if you look at the crisis in Islamic economics, you will see uh, the answers to these questions. <clears throat> so I'm going to look at the first generation Islamic economics. Why was it born? Due to historical forces. So again, I want to emphasize that this is not a question which is studied by Western social science, but we are going to ask why did first generation Islamic economic get born in the 20th century? So as I've said before, in early 20th century, 90% of the Islamic world was colonized. In 1914 to 18, World War I occurred. And the strength of the Western powers was uh, reduced because 20 million people died and the young people were wiped out. In fact, we see a lot of um, a lot of immorality in the West. That happened because all of the young people were dead at the end of World War I. And there were many women. The women actually made protest. They went to the church. And they said, you know, the Bible allows multiple marriages. We see a lot of prophets and they had many wives. And so please allow multiple marriages because there are not enough young men for all the women. But the church refused. So then they started this zina and uh, other things which are, which are now very common in the West because there were just not enough men around for all the women. So after World War I, which shaped West, uh, the strength of the West was very much reduced. And also in the World War I, a lot of troops were taken from the colonies. And these people learned how to fight. And they realized that we can fight for ourselves. We don't have to fight for the colonizer. <clears throat> so basically, in the World War II, uh, liberation struggle started. and uh, by you know, by the 1950s, all of the colonies were liberated 
except for Philistine. Philistine is the last surviving colony of the rest. So now, when you fight against the colonizer, you're, you have to take a chance. <coughs> you have to risk your life. So it requires an ideological basis. You have to believe in something. And so uh, all over the Islamic world, there were theorists who were saying that we have our own social system, we have our own political system, we have our own economic system. So at that time, they started. Bakr Sadr spelled out the, uh, how the Islamic economy would look like, the ideological basis, the big ideas. Similarly, Maulana Maududi in Pakistan spelled out the ideological basis. And there were many other thinkers in the Islamic world who explained what an Islamic economic would like. And they were very emphatic. They were very clear that this has nothing to do with capitalism and it has nothing to do with communism. And it has nothing to do with socialism. Islamic economics is completely different. It's revolutionary. It's radical. And their books were all about explaining the difference between an Islamic economy and capitalism and socialism and communism. And capitalism, socialism, and communism, they're all based on kufr. All three of these philosophies, they're based on the idea that welfare comes from possession of materials. But how should we get more wealth? This is the question. Now, in capitalism, they say, okay, we should compete for it and let everybody get their own wealth and fight each other. In communism, they say, you know, the state will be responsible to uh, get the maximum wealth and give it to everybody. And in socialism, they say that, okay, we should have some competition, but also the state should take responsibility for those poor people who are left behind. But in all three cases, the pursuit of wealth is the goal of society. And so this is rejected by Islam already. <laughs> pursuit of wealth is not the goal of society. <laughs> so Islamic economics was an ideological basis for the freedom struggles. That is why it was formulated, because uh, Muslim economies were listen, Muslim um, people were living under communism or under capitalism or under socialism, and they said, no, when we become free of this rule, we will have our own economic system. Now, one thing that <clears throat> it is important to understand is that uh, economics itself is a religion. Uh, it is, um, although they say we reject God, then rejection of God becomes a religion. And, <clears throat> uh, this uh, economics was born after the rejection of Christianity in the West. So then the religion is the pursuit of wealth. If there is no <coughs> afterlife, no God, no day of judgment, then money becomes your God because you uh, need it to do anything in this dunya. This dunya is your only concern. And with money, you can buy anything in the dunya. So it means that. Gold is uh, wealth is the pursuit. So um, Adam Smith wrote the wealth of nations. This is the key thing that nations need. They need to have more wealth. And this is the spirit of Western education. This is very important because this is the poison which is planted into the minds of Muslim youth all over the world by Western education. That the goal of life is to make money. So, <clears throat> um, basically, then still there is the question of why Islamic economics was not, nobody wrote, why nobody write about this in, for a thousand years. The reason is <clears throat> that economics, politics, society, all three are mixed together. So, there's lots of stuff on economics, but it is mixed in with politics and with social institutions. And throughout the books, there is no concept in Islam that economics is separate from politics and society. And it is not true. If you think about economics in Pakistan, who is rich, who is poor, who is getting, <coughs> who is getting jobs, who is, who is giving jobs, it all has to do with social class and power. Who is in power? 
and why are they in power and the power class seeks to replicate itself so they keep the money to themselves um, there was no uh, economic teachings had not been collected in one place before because they are not separate from the other teachings of islam so religious teaching a political teaching social teaching and economic they're all in one place so the economic institutions serve the society so we have um, so that's why nobody had done it before but because in the west economics had become separated so we said okay we will collect our all all our economic teaching and put it in one place and show how the economics of an islamic society is different from capitalism this was the need of the time at that time such a need had not existed before <clears throat> So the first generation claimed that Islamic economic system is superior to the Western economic systems. It guarantees prosperity for everyone. It doesn't have this class conflict. It doesn't have the capitalists and the laborers fighting each other. It doesn't have a top 1%, which is extremely rich, and the bottom 90%, which is extremely poor. <clears throat> So what happened was, and this is what led to second generation, that the, the, after the revolutions, after the freedom, the class which came into power all over the Islamic world were stooges and puppets of the West. <coughs> so these people wanted to preserve the Western power. So they preserved all of the social structures, the justice system in Pakistan is Western, not Sharia. The economic system of Pakistan is Western, not based on Islamic ideas. We have insurance companies, we have banks, we don't have waqf, we don't have takaful, uh, proper Islamic takaful. So we did not create the structures that our thinkers had been asking for. We did not go follow the ideas of Bakr Sadr and Maududi and others to build an Islamic society. Why? Because there was no power. In the Islamic societies, Muslims did not have power. So that was, so after the liberation, political Islam was started. What is political Islam? It said that first we must capture power, then we will be able to implement our ideas about what Islamic society is. Without power, we cannot implement uh, an Islamic economic system. <clears throat> so, uh, for until the 1970s, the first generation ideas were prominent, but um, in the 1970s, a lot of thinkers said that, you know, this revolution is not going to come. Nobody, we don't have the power, we don't have enough power to take control. So, then they said that, okay. Uh, what we will do is we will take capitalism and we will modify it to become Islamic. So this is the Islamization of knowledge project, which started after the failure of political Islam. See, the political Islam people thought that we will capture power and then we will create our Islamic economy. And then they said, okay, uh, they tried all over the world. There were movements to capture power and they failed. Uh, the Irani revolution succeeded after that not in the 70s and the uh, some other there were some other successful revolutions uh, later on but in the 70s the second generation started and they started by saying that political islam will not succeed we will not create a revolution and so <clears throat> um, they said okay let's take capitalist economics and modify it so there is a famous formula that Islamic economics equals capitalist economics plus zakat minus interests. I have this paper on capital crisis in Islam, which explains that what happened was the second generation approach failed. Because when you start with something which is the opposite of Islam and you try to Islamize it, you can't do it. If you say that, okay, we're going to build economics on competition, and on individualism and on hedonism, and then say, okay, let's modify it to make it Islamic. You can't do it. The foundations are wrong. And so the second generation Islamic economics project failed completely throughout the world. 
they did not contribute any single positive idea, not even one idea. And over the three decades, since 1970s, 80s, 90s, 2000, there were no good ideas presented by Islamic men. At the same time, a lot of different people made a lot of different revolutionary contributions to economics. So there was behavioral economics and evolutionary economics and environmental economics and many other. And all of these ideas actually come from Islamic ideas, but the Muslims were not putting forth these ideas. Other people were doing it. So this is the failure of second generation. So, I mean, uh, most people today in the world are second generation Islamic economics. So this is the thing. So one question we can ask them is that, why do you have not even one new idea to offer to economics? Is our Quran and Sunnah completely dead? There is nothing new we can give to the West in the uh, realm of economics. The message of God doesn't have anything new not, guidance for us today. So I think this can be the last slide. So in 2008, I think I can say that the global financial crisis, 2007-8, everybody realized that the conventional capitalist economics is a complete failure. The capitalist economists could not even predict the coming of the crisis and they could not handle it afterwards. There was a global recession and they don't really understand even today what happened <clears throat> because they're all of the leading theories of macroeconomics, even today, cannot explain the global financial crisis. So what is written in the textbooks is completely useless. So <clears throat> with this collapse, we have the freedom to create, rebuild economics on new foundations. And while they are trying to do so in their own way, there are uh, revolutionary ideas in economics which are uh, currently being studied in the West. We have our own opportunity. And so uh, the third generation Islamic economics rejects all of Western economics completely. And he say, we well, let's go back to our own intellectual tradition. Let's go to Ibn Khaldun, let's go to the scholars of Islam and how they studied. There is, there's a very interesting book uh, by David Graeber, which is called Debt, the First 5,000 Years. And in this book, he writes that Adam Smith borrowed all his ideas about economics from a Persian school of economics, thinkers. So I haven't actually been able to follow up on this. He writes this. There was some school of thinkers of economics in Persia, and he has borrowed all of the ideas from them um, in his book. So this is something worth following up. But anyway, uh, I, this is my last slide and I'm going to stop the talk here. That the third generation is not Islamization of knowledge project. It is rejection of Western knowledge and replacement by the intellectual heritage of Islam. So we were going for a rooted revival. We, we build, we go back to the intellectual tradition of Islam and we build an economic theory based on the uh, tradition of Islam. So uh, that's what third generation economics is. And this is a good place to stop because we, we just started to explain what it is and then we can develop more details later. So I'm going to stop this sharing here and we can have some discussion now. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your thought. Uh, uh, knowledgeable and uh, it was very valuable uh, to all of us. Uh, uh, if you uh, allow me, I, I have a, just a question that came across to my mind, uh, and maybe I can propose it next week, but uh, the floor is yours. Uh, if you allow me, I can uh, ask my question. Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, I'm very interested in the concept of the third generation uh, Islamic economics. However, I have a, a few concerns. Uh, about uh, its practicality. Practicality. Uh, first, uh, I'm not sure that all people have the Islamic motivations uh, that are assumed in this model you uh, mentioned. Uh, even uh, Muslims can be even pious Muslims, uh, really pure Muslims, 
uh, in, in nowadays uh, can be drawn into the world of capitalism. Uh, and uh, it may be difficult for them to imagine living outside of, outside of uh, it. Second, I am concerned about uh, how economic incentives uh, would be managed in an Islamic economy. The idea of relying on God's satisfaction may have worked uh, in the early days of Islamic revolution, as you mentioned in 1979. Um, it worked in, this, in that those days, uh, but uh, it, uh, it didn't continue. And uh, how it would be work in long term? How can we persist on the uh, Islamic uh, values? Uh, third, I'm not sure how an Islamic economy could be built with, without first building an Islamic society. Uh, how can we create a society that is based on Islamic values and that is resistant to change? <coughs> finally, uh, finally, I'm concerned about the, how an econ Islamic economy would interact with Western, Western institutions. Uh, we live in a globalized world and it is not clear how we could uh, isolate our, ourselves from a capitalist system like bank, insurance. Uh, I would be interested uh, to hear your thoughts on these uh, concerns. Well, you have asked about five questions and each of these yeah. questions requires a lecture of uh, 90 minutes or so. <laughs> so I don't think I can give you a short answer, but uh, I have a paper, actually, I think I read this paper in Iran in another conference, not at the, in another time. It's called um, Building Islamic Humanities and basically uh, an Islamic approach to humanities. You can find it on the internet. So there are three dimensions in which, you see, according to Western theory, economics is positive, it describes reality. And uh, this is false. So when we think of Islamic economics as being positive and we say, OK, Islamic society is cooperative, but there is no cooperation in the world, even in the Islamic world. So what do we do? This is where the question is coming from. Now, Islamic economics is not like that. Islamic economics says that there are three dimensions. And I think this will answer all of your questions, hopefully. There is the positive dimension which describes the world as it is. People are. Uh, Quran says that the people, the love of dunya is in their hearts. So Quran doesn't reject the idea that, you know, people are like animals. Uh, Asfala Safilin, people can be like Asfala Safilin and they can be also Ashraf al So, So all of the possibility of behavior. So positive just describes this person is evil. This is good. This is in the middle. He is Nafsil Lawama. He is Nafsil Ammara. He is Nafsil Mutmainna. So actually, and in another place, I've said that modern economic theory is the economics of nafse ammara. It's very precisely. I mean, they, they say that there's only nafse ammara in the world and everybody has nafse ammara. So then you get modern economics. It's homo economics is, is nafse ammara. So Islamic economics says that, okay, there are some people who have nafse ammara and some people who are in a higher spiritual stage. And our goal is to transform everybody towards higher to, to make spiritual progress. So that's the positive describing the world as it is without any uh, without any idealization, without any romanticism. Then there is the normative, which is the first best, the completely ideal, perfect world in which everybody is. So that describes where you're trying to go and where you are. And then the third element is the transformative. So how do you get from here to there? So then you look at, okay, this is the situation we are in. This is where we want to get to. And now what is the step we take? And the step must be taken from where you are. It cannot be taken from where you are trying to get to. So from where we are, what is the next step to get closer to the ideal? So these are the three dimensions in which you operate. And all of the questions, how, do, how will our economy relate to the international economy? How will we create an Islamic society? How will we create an Islamic economics? Actually, it's not that you must first create an Islamic society and then you will create Islamic economics. It's not like that. Well, what happens is that you do whatever you can in economic dimension, in political dimension, in judicial dimension, 
And as you make those changes, your society becomes gradually more and more Islamic. And so as you make efforts, you take simple, small, small steps. A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. So you do what you can. And this, what you can do, will make your society a little bit closer to an Islamic society. And as you keep making those steps in economic dimension, in political dimension, in education, in health, eventually, if Allah wills, you will get to an Islamic society. But if it doesn't, then we are not responsible for the outcome. We are only responsible for the struggle. So if we, as long as we are making the effort, we are successful. Even if we never get to the ideal. Right. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, uh, that was very nice. Uh, but uh, how about uh, how can we predict uh, the outcome? I mean, uh, you mentioned the modern society, the capitalism, uh, failed to predict uh, the, the future in the 2018 crisis. Uh, how can we, uh, you know, propose alternative <coughs> approach to predict the future? Um, actually. Some events are unpredictable, some are predictable. Uh, this is exactly what the contribution of Ibn Khaldun was. He studied the process of social change. So you can look at things which are changing and what effect they will have on the future. Now the economics is fixed on equilibrium. And so they cannot predict change. So they are unable to predict change and that's why. But if we say, if we have a theory of change, we will be able to see what things are changing, what things are changing very fast. And there were some very critical indicators. Uh, debt levels were very high and uh, certain kinds of risks, if you looked at them in the market, they were going very high and beyond the sustainable levels. And so uh, many people actually did predict, non -econ not economists and not based on theories, but practical people in the field saw what was happening and, and predicted the uh, crisis. Michael Hudson is very important reference to read uh, for this purpose. So things are predictable if you're studying the process of change. Things are not predictable if you're studying equilibrium and economists study equilibrium, so they cannot predict change. You mentioned Michael Hudson. Yes. Uh, who is it? Could you explain more about him? Oh, Michael Hudson is an economist who has a fairly deep insight into uh, real world economics, not unlike the textbook theories. It's not oh. it's, the, the conventional economics textbooks are uh, completely wrong. They, they are misleading, they're deceptive, they teach theories which are false. Um, many people, when they talk to me, they think that I, I, I am against the West and I don't want to accept anything Western. This is wrong. I, I just accept, I just don't like wrong Western theories, but there are some good Western theorists. And Michael Hudson is a good economist and he has studied the world and he understands. And he, he has also this principle of histo history. He understands mm -hmm. economics in context of history. So we need uh, the help of those people who understand the world as it is instead of trying to build false theories about it. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, let me give the floor to others today if they have any questions. Uh, 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 Ask a question very quickly, and then uh, we can close the session for today. Okay, Mr. Sabah, we'll go ahead. Can you hear me, yes. Professor? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your very good and uh, very useful presentation. Uh, my question is uh, that, uh, as we all know, uh, capitalism uh, as a thought uh, has uh, penetrated uh, the people of the uh, world. Uh, considering uh, the historical break that European country and US, uh, I mean Western countries, uh, have created for uh, Islamic countries. Uh, it seems uh, that uh, we, have to f we have to fight with the minds of the people uh, of the yes. world uh, to destroy the effects of capitalism. Uh, yes. is, that is that correct? Uh, do you think uh, we can su uh, succeed in destroying uh, capitalism thinking and what method uh, do you suggest? 
Yes, this is exactly very, very accurate, mashallah, very intelligent question. And my focus of my efforts is on the decolonization of education. The main tool and instrument by which minds are colonized are, is a university education. Today, we do not have an alternative to modern university education. Our religious seminaries are not sufficient to counter the effects of Western education. So we have to fight them on their own front. And uh, I have a lecture on decolonization of education, which I think is critical to the efforts that we need to make. And I have a, a string of lectures on how to launch an Islamic revival in which I have explained all of the thousand things that need to be done to do what you are saying. But you have, this is the critical point that we have to change the methods of education in order to decolonize minds. Because the Western education that we all receive produces colonized minds. And our traditional madrasa education is not enough to come to this. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the leader of Iran, uh, Imam Sayyid Ali Khamenei, uh, says jihad of uh, explanation, I mean uh, jihad tabiin, uh, jihad of explanation uh, is one of the best ways to remove the uh, foundations of uh, capitalism uh, and uh, I mean uh, capitalist thinking. Uh, explanation explanation uh, jihad means uh, uh, curate uh, or explain, uh, correct and immediate uh, expre expression of uh, the teachings of Islam uh, and revolution. Uh, according to him, uh, explanation jihad, I mean uh, jihad of uh, explanation, uh, is a, a duty in Iran. Uh, and as the uh, prophets also came uh, for the same purpose. Um, as uh, it says uh, in uh, the whole Quran, uh, uh, the Quran has a bayan al nas, and uh, the base basic um, uh, issue of uh, the jihad of explanation. Uh, do you agree with uh, him? I think that uh, the battle for the minds and the hearts of the Muslims uh, all over the world must be fought on many fronts. In fact, we need to replace the entire um, the university curriculum. So we have to create an Islamic biology, Islamic economics, Islamic sociology, Islamic education, Islamic institutions. So uh, what Imam Khomeini was talking about was actually a very yani, practical and pragmatic and uh, necessity to sustain the Iranian revolution you need to protect the ideological basis for that revolution. And so the people, the, 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 the weakest point of the revolution is the people's thinking and falling back into capitalist thinking. So to protect the revolution, this was the need of the time for his time at that time. And that was the most important thing. But if you think of from the perspective of the Ummah, that is just one of many different fronts. And in different societies, you are in different places, and different oh. kinds of efforts are necessary. And at different times, Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. It was very nice. Uh, if, okay, others, today, if you have any question, uh, raise your hand and uh, don't hesitate. Uh, it seems they keep their question for next week, I think. All right. Uh, <laughs> you want to got it. But uh, before yeah. we leave this session, uh, you mentioned uh, an article, Building Islamic Humanity. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. There was a paper on, um, I don't have the link right now, but if I put the name on it, uh, an Islamic approach to humanities. Or you can also look for three. Uh, 
basically everything is available on my blog mm -hmm. uh, so if you go to my blog and you look for um, any item you will be able to find thank you very much professor uh, i recently used your website for your workshops and webinars and articles and i also follow you on linkedin and read your articles Good night. Uh, so i just want to end with the message that actually uh -huh. the biggest battlefield that we face is on the intellectual front not on the battlefield with the arms and the weapons and this is a battle in which we have been failing and we have not managed to counter the intellectual dominance of the west and we have this this is the battle in which all of you can contribute the students are the our army for the future and the battle they have to fight is not to be fought with the weapons in philistine it has to be fought with the books and the theories these are the most important things that we need to learn you need to understand why the western theories are very foolish and irrelevant and not applicable in the western Islamic world and we have to build on our own tradition which is actually one of the strengths of imam sadiq university especially and we have to build on our own heritage and to come up with the things which counter the ideas of the west and we have to build our economies on the basis of our own ideas not on the basis of western ideas and not on the basis of islamization of knowledge so this is my message to the youth of islam okay thank you very Thank you very much. Wa alaikum. Wa alaikum.